Hey, good morning, church. Would you guys stand with us? What a beautiful day. We get to gather in and worship the Lord together in spirit and in truth. We get to sing Hosanna to the King of Kings and the Lord of the Lords. So let's sing that out this morning.
Lord, how thankful we are for such a beautiful Sunday morning to gather around you. Um, Lord, just that admonition of the psalmist, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We count it a privilege, Lord, not just something we do as a routine on a Sunday morning, but a chance to meet the God of all creation, a chance to circle around your son, Jesus, a chance to open up the Bible and hear from your word. Lord, what a privilege it is. I pray that we'd approach this morning with reverence uh, to your word and to the truth. Give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church today. Uh, bless those that are here in the sanctuary, but also those watching online, Lord, just to, that everyone would find themselves praising your holy name, not just in song, but also as we study the word. So be glorified, be honored in this place, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. November 9th, 1996, the fight, boxing, um, they called it finally because everybody was waiting for this big meeting between Evander Holyfield and Mike Tyson. Um, the fight was, uh, you know, uh, won by Evander Holyfield, but it was kind of a dubious win. In fact, there were, you know, those that he headbutted his way through that match and it wasn't a legitimate victory. And so there was a rematch between uh, the victorious Evander, the real deal Holyfield, uh, who was a believer, by the way, Christian guy, um, but fighting against uh, Mike Tyson. Uh, and um, the second fight, well, it became maybe one of the most infamous um, sporting events in history. Uh, and it wasn't because of the great fight. It was what happened in the fight. Evander was hold, uh, holding, you know, the, the winning, I should say, the first two rounds. Uh, Mike Tyson was getting frustrated. Um, and so they kind of were, you know, tangling up and fighting. And, and Mike Tyson reached around with his teeth and bit the ear of Evander Holyfield. Uh, and, uh, you know, blood and the whole thing. And, and so they kind of paused the fight, got him in their corners. And, you know, they said, okay, this, you're losing two points for biting his ear. Uh, don't do that again, kind of thing. And, and then they resumed the fight. And a few seconds later, he bites the other ear off. Like he literally bites his ear off. And Patui, the ear flops on the ground there on the boxing ring. Um, and so they called the fight. Evander, you know, wins uh, by, you know, the Mike Tyson being disqualified. And it just, you know, was kind of... Now, that's not the end of the, the, the eerie story. Um, there's an eerie... Sorry. Um, the eerie part is they actually collected the little chunk of ear on the, on the mat and they put it in, wrapped it in latex and stuck it in a bag of ice and when Evander was taken to the ambulance uh, to go to the hospital to get his ear fixed, um, they stuck that bag of ice and the ear in the ambulance uh, and they took off. The mystery is uh, when they got to the hospital, uh, they pulled Evander out and then they said, okay, now where's the ear chunk? And they looked all over, they couldn't find it. They never did find the bag of ice with the ear in it. Um, and so, you know, nobody knows what happened. So they had to kind of reconstruct his ear without that piece of uh, flesh and what have you. Now, uh, uh, since then, they've made up and had, you know, stuff. That, probably one of the funniest commercials out there, if you want to look it up, it's the, uh, what is it, the Foot Locker. And uh, uh, Mike Tyson comes and knocks on the door of Evander Holyfield's house and Holyfield answers. And he's like, yeah, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry for biting your ear, you know. And, um, and Holyfield's just kind of looking at him and he hands him this little jewelry box uh, and uh, he opens it up and he's, and Evander's like, that's my ear uh, chunk, you know, like uh, Tyson stole it or something. And he said, it's okay, I put it in formaldehyde. You know, like it's a, uh, it's a funny commercial. You'll just have to look it up. Don't look it up right now. You know who you are. You're already like, doo -doo 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 -doo. now you say, Brett, what in the world does that have to do with the Bible? Uh, you're, we're a Christian church and you're talking about um, very much. We have uh, another eerie story for you today. Uh, and it's quite amazing. Uh, we have ears flopping on the ground. It's the same thing, quite notorious uh, story in the Bible. Luke chapter 22, verse 47 is where we'll pick it up. Luke 22, 47. And there we read, it says, and while he yet spake, behold, a multitude and he that was called Judas, one of the 12 went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? And when they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them then uh, smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, suffer ye thus far. 
and he touched his ear and healed him. I told you it's an eerie story. Here we have the servant of the high priest. Now we know this guy's name, by the way, is Malchus, we learn from John's gospel. In fact, all four gospels give us the account of the chopping off of the ear uh, on the Mount of Olives here by the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the, the night they apprehended Jesus. Um, and you say, what is this story in the Bible for? And I believe every word of the Bible is inspired, God-breathed and important for us. So there's not a, a non-important section of scripture, but I, I wanna take this little snapshot. We'll, we'll, we'll cover this whole chapter on Wednesday, which is an important chapter. Um, but this little snapshot of, of this chopping off of the ear of Malchus, the high priest servant. Um, you know, what's funny about the four gospels is uh, we don't even know who this is. Uh, uh, Matthew says someone drew a sword and chopped off the ear. Um, Mark's gospel, does anybody remember who was behind the writing of the gospel of Mark? Peter, if you remember our study there, Peter. And the, that gospel says, I don't know, some guy pulled a sword and chopped off the ear of some guy in the garden. Like it was very vague. Um, if you read Luke, what we just did, it says one of them, verse 50, we still don't know who it is. Now this is where the Bible kind of cracks me up. There's some funny things in the Bible. One of those is a bit of a rivalry, it seems, between Peter and John. Um, because it's John that says, it was Peter. Peter did it. Uh, Peter's the one who chopped off the ear of, of the high priest servant. Like uh, John does it, is not afraid. And you see this all throughout the story. It, it, there's like this thing between John and Peter. Um, remember when Jesus uh, was talking to Peter, uh, you know, telling him how he would suffer uh, and, you know, be, be even, you know, uh, martyred for the faith. Um, do you remember what Peter's first response was? What's going to happen to John? Like he didn't care, like you're, you're gonna die a torture death. Like, yeah, whatever, what's gonna happen to John? That's the first thing. In the gospel of John, John's writing about the, the two disciples and he explains who they were that were running to the tomb on resurrection Sunday morning. And he said, the disciple whom Jesus loved, yours truly, John, that's what he called himself, the disciple. And it's true, you know, but, um, but he says, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved and Peter ran to the tomb. And then John's really making it clear. And John made it to the tomb first. Like, why, did that, why is that even in the Bible? Who cares? Here's the thing, I just know it. John's this deeply spiritual gazelle-like figure, probably a kale-eating, you know, track athlete or something. And Peter's this big fisherman. So John, boing, 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 makes it to the tomb. And here's Peter, like five minutes later. <gasps> oh, hold on. <sighs> okay, what's going on here? You know, like, that's Peter. Uh, I can relate to poor Pete um, in the story. Some of you are those gazelles that we resent. But John makes sure in the Bible, it gets in there for all of humanity to see that John won the race to the tomb. You kind of see this. Now, Now, what I love about the story is just the, you know, they don't stain glass all these characters. In fact, some of the greatest people in the Bible, we see all their flaws and failures and Peter's no exception. Peter is a guy who, uh, in fact, the, the gospel narrative is quite embarrassing how much of a blundering goofball of a disciple he is. And most of what we read about in the gospel narrative is what not to do when you read about Peter. There's a few great moments, but uh, mostly embarrassing moments for Peter. Now, the good thing about Peter is after he, Jesus dies on the cross, resurrects, ascends into heaven, the Holy Spirit comes upon Peter and man, suddenly we see this, well, really a pillar of the early church. Peter was truly a great man and did some great things. So in a few weeks, when we get to the book of Acts, you're gonna hear me compliment Peter and, and you know, we'll be impressed with Peter. But for the time being, I'm gonna kind of use Peter as a great example of what not to do. Especially in this story, there's several things I'd like to point out. But before we do that, one of the significant parts of this story is something we brought up on Wednesday night, and that is the idea of the sword. Um, you know, uh, when it comes to politics, I don't deal with po political subjects here at Aether Creek. Some of you are laughing, saying, yes, you do. Uh, I don't, I don't deal with political subjects. I do not talk about politics. I talk about Bible. Anything in the Bible, like for example, if I talk about abortion, which I do, but that's political. No, it's biblical. Long before it was a horrible political debate, it was a biblical notion that God cares about the unborn child. He's creating a person in a mother's womb. And, and it's totally against God's word to, to not count the, the baby in a mother's womb as a life. And so I'm not talking politics, I'm talking about the Bible. Well, Brad, I've heard you talk about Israel. Israel's another thing that's not political, it's biblical. All throughout the Bible. Um, so some of you Second Amendment people, you know who y'all are, 
Uh, you say, Brett, well, why don't you talk about the Second Amendment? Well, I normally don't because we don't really read much about that in the Bible. If there's even a tiny smidge of Second Amendment in the Bible, you find that in Luke 21. And we talked about that on Wednesday night. Uh, and so what did we conclude? You're gonna have to listen to Wednesday night if you're wondering. Um, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the Bible, I think, does uh, support self-defense. And even Jesus tells his disciples, uh, get some swords, because the journey we're about to go on is more dangerous uh, than some of the other times in our ministry. And, and, um, and then the, if you know the story, two disciples ran up and said, well, here's a couple swords. And Jesus said, it's enough. And then the, the scholars rage. What did Jesus mean when he said, is it enough? Like, uh, was Jesus saying two swords will be enough? Good work, guys, getting a couple weapons? Or was Jesus saying two swords is plenty? Enough already. You guys stop being, uh, you know, uh, you know sword grabbing, Bible hugging conservatives. Uh, is that what he's saying? And people debate all that stuff. But um, so, uh, the, you know, we talked about that. One of the things that I still think we should emphasize when it comes to the Second Amendment and, and you know, the Jesus telling his disciples to have swords and stuff, um, the, the one thing you do, if you're going to be a good theological uh, student of the Bible, you have to count. How many times does the Bible talk about something uh, versus the opposite sort of idea? And so when it comes to the idea of self-defense and weaponry, I think you can make a bit of a, a defense in the Bible for that. That's my opinion. And I've talked about that from, from you know, Wednesday night. But you also have to count how many times does the Bible say stuff like love your enemies, do good to those that persecute you, um, like pray for those who despitefully use you, not shoot them, pray for them. Like it's an amazing thing. I, I think that Christians will glob onto one little thread of something and forget what the rest of the Bible actually teaches. And that's one of those things we cautioned everybody about on Wednesday night. So it's a bit of a complex issue, but this, this sword idea comes into play now. So the disciples have two swords. Um, we're told in chapter 21, now uh, Jesus is being apprehended, betrayed by Judas. And so the disciples ask the question, Lord, is this the time we're supposed to pull out the swords? And what happens? Jesus doesn't even have a chance to answer. And who's pulling out the sword already and starting to zorro it up? Peter. That's what we see in this story. Kind of interesting. So um, Jesus, uh, he says here, and notice in our, our text here in verse uh, 51, Jesus uh, uh, answers and says, suffer ye thus far. And then he touched the guy's ear and healed him. Um, that's King James language that we don't use very much. The ESV, if you have an ESV translate, English Standard Version, it says um, rightly, no more of this. That's what Jesus says. So Peter whoosh, whoosh, chops off the ear and, and Jesus says, no more of that. Um, John 18, 11, Jesus says to Peter, put your sword in its sheath. That's what he tells them to do. Um, so uh, this idea of the sword and, and Peter using the sword, uh, what is there to learn about uh, this from, from Peter? First of all, one thing you should know, when, whenever I read about in the Bible, the sword, if you're a Bible student, have you been studying the Bible? The sword is a type, a picture of something. So whenever I read about a sword in the Bible, it makes me think of that type that the Bible explains of itself. Does anybody recall what is a sword in the Bible, a picture of, a type of? The word of God. This Bible that we hold in a sort of a figurative way, it says the word of God is like a sword. We read that in a bunch of places. In fact, um, you know, when Jesus returns, there's this amazing Ill, a painting, if you would. And by the way, if you're an artist, can I just ask you, stop painting the book of Revelation? I don't think the book of Revelation's imagery that you read is not, it's not meant to be painted. I think it's meant to be understood. Uh, I've seen some hideous paintings of the book. Like for example, the, the second coming of Jesus, it, you know, there's all these things, you know, he's got a tattoo on his leg, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's coming riding on a white horse. Picture's all right so far. But then you read, he's got this double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And you're like, who's gonna paint that? Is that a good way to paint Jesus coming with us? But that's what it says. There's a sword coming out of his mouth. But if you're a Bible student, you know what that image is supposed to be saying. What, what is that actually a picture of, anybody? It's when Jesus comes again, he's gonna have his word, the sword, the double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. If you would, if you know the Revelation 19 picture there, it means that the word of God is the indictment against the world that has rejected Jesus Christ as savior. And it's his word that's gonna come out against them that will indict the world when he comes to judge and be the king of kings and lord of lords. It's, I'm not sure it's meant to be painted. It's meant to be understood. That's, that's kind of the thing. 
But that's a big one. The sword is coming out of his mouth. That's the word of God. Now, uh, there's some really plain scriptures that uh, are very clear. For example, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick or living is a word that's better translated there. Living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing uh, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow. It is the discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Um, this is what the sword of the word of God does. It, it sort of cuts away, uh, divides part, the parts of us that are stuck together that shouldn't be, the evil versus the good, our intentions that are good intentions and bad intentions and, and our soul. That like it's a spiritual weapon to cut away evil is kind of the idea from, from this, the word of God. Now, uh, let, let's take it to just another small level of understanding. When the Bible talks about itself being like a sword, uh, it's the one weapon of our warfare. The, you know, the scriptures say our weapons of our warfare are not carnal or literal weapons, but spiritual weapons for the tearing down of strongholds. Um, and so that's what the word of God is. It's a spiritual weapon that we can use. And the, the sword is the, is the weapon of choice that it's compared to. But this is taken a little deeper. Did you know there's two kinds of swords that are talked about in comparison to the word of God? Um, if you're a sword fan and you like studying swordology, you know that there's all kinds of swords throughout history. A medieval period was probably the most interesting time of swordsmanship. And uh, there was huge giant swords that only the strongest men could lift and use in battle. Um, then there was little light swords that were like whoosh, more of the swashbuckling little swords that were quick and easy to stick people. Um, but you know, there's, there's all kinds of swords, but the Bible actually talks about two kinds of sword. And this word that we just see here in Hebrews 4.12, you got to look at the word, word. For the word of God is quick and powerful. So we're talking about a powerful sword that's living and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So we got a big two-edged sword, but I wanna pull out the word word. If you look up the word word here, it's a word that some of you might be familiar with, uh, logos, or some people say logos. Either way you wanna say it. Um, but the idea of the logos word, it's, it's the scripture the Bible that we hold in our hand. It's, it's the broad term of all the truth and the teaching and the sayings of God in this book that we hold, the Logos, the written living word of God, sharper than any big giant two-edged sword. Um, and so there's the Logos word that's compared to a sword. If you go to Ephesians, uh, as it turns out, Ephesians 6, 17, the same notion, but in Ephesians, we're talking about the full armor of God, if you're familiar with the Bible. And it says, you know, this one verse, it says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So there again, we have the, uh, the word of God being uh, pictured by the sword. But the, the word for word here is not logos or logos, but it's this other word, it's called rhema, the rhema word, which is a specific, and this is kind of a hard thing to, uh, in our modern vernacular, quickened word or a living word that's more specific or exacting. You say, Brett, what's the difference? The logos is the written, perfect, inspired word of God. The rhema is that exacting word from the Lord that comes to the believer. Now, have you ever been reading your morning devotions in your Bible and you're just reading along and you're reading the logos, but you're dealing with something in your life specifically and you're wrestling with issues, you don't know what to do, but as you're reading, suddenly the verse kind of jumps out at you and you realize, wow, this is, this is the Lord speaking to me about my situation. And um, that's more the rhema where it's specific. Other people might even read that passage and not necessarily glean the same understanding because it doesn't apply to them in the same way. But maybe the Lord uses that part of scripture to speak exactingly into your life. Um, that's what we would call the rhema word, which, uh, which is also like a sword, the Bible tells us. Um, the rhema, however, is the sword. That's not the big, long, heavy sword that only the strongest men can bear. But the idea is that more of a small, specific sword, you might even call it like an assassin's sword. Um, if you were gonna go and try to sneak a weapon in, would you bring the big, long, you know, four foot long, heavy, double-edged sword? Or would you bring a shorter, like 18 inch sword with a little handle and hide it under your cloak? Um, uh, there were people that did those things in, in those Bible times. Um, that would be the more, the rhema, which is the smaller sword when we talk about Ephesians 6, you know, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema, the word of God. 
Now, um, uh, so logos is all scripture. Rhema is more specific scripture applied to our lives. Um, uh, you know, the rhema would be the small sword, the logos is the big sword. Now, um, have you ever, you know, been studying or even in a sermon? Like, have you ever been to church listening to a sermon and, and the Lord just kind of hits you with something and you're like, oh man, that was for me. Uh, I've been preaching now for 40 years and people come up after church and say, Brett, who told you? Someone told you what I was wrestling with. Going I'm like, nope, that, that's, <laughs> that's when the Holy Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, the rhema has been speaking into your life. Um, I love when that happens. I've had people come up and tell me what I shared and it had nothing to do with what I shared. And somehow they got some different things out of that sermon that I didn't even intend for it to happen, but it was maybe the Lord just saying, no, I want this person to have that specific word, the rhema word. Um, this has been funny over the years. I've had funny stories. In fact, one of the stories when I was a you know, pastor that we were at, at Athey Creek Middle School, when we were first starting Athey Creek, a few years into it, I was preaching on a sermon and dismissed afterward and everybody was standing around talking. I was talking to people for like 20 minutes when this guy comes running in and he's got like a bead of sweat on his forehead and he comes running in, Pastor Fred, I need your help. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, um, my wife has locked the car and she won't let me in. And I was thinking, wow, that, that's a bummer. What's going on? And she's mad at me, really mad. And she's also really mad at you. And I said, uh-oh, what, 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 what'd we do? Um, <laughs> And she said, she is convinced that I called her right before the, called you right before the service because we were arguing uh, earlier in the morning about a topic, kind of a bad argument. And you preached exactly what we were arguing about. And you kind of landed on my side of the argument. <laughs> and he said, man, you're in trouble. And she won't let me in the car. So we went out in the parking lot. This is a true story. Went out of the parking lot and I kind of knocked on the door and she rolled her window down like an inch. And, and, and I said, you know, uh, what, what's, what's going on? And she said, I can't believe you do that, Pastor Brad. I, you know, I trusted that you would, you know, you know. and, and I, I said, listen, I don't even know your husband. I've never talked to him. I've, this is the first time I've ever met him. And uh, that, this is what, the, what we're, we were teaching. And I explained how we're going verse by verse through the Bible. And I didn't even choose the passage. It's just where we are. And, and it, it took me about 15 minutes to convince her that he and I had not talked on the phone. Once she realized that it was really not us colluding together, she burst into tears and understood uh, that maybe the Lord was trying to tell her something that morning. Um, and it actually turned out to uh, work out really nicely and uh, the Lord blessed that. Um, but that's what happens when, when the Lord gives you that exacting specific thing and it hits your heart, that's the rhema. Now, before we move off from that, there is a danger with the rhema word or the so-called rhema word. Have you ever had somebody walk up to you, the Lord told me, and then fill in the blank. You're like, uh, I don't think the Lord told you that. I think that was a pizza that you ate the night before. Uh, <laughs> it's not the Lord telling you that. How, how, how could you and I have the discernment to know if it's truly the rhema word from the Lord? Because it gets a little loosey-goosey with a specific word. The Lord told me that I'm supposed to shoot my boss because I hate him and I'm going to kill him. God told me. And you can say, uh, no. How do you and I know that's, obviously I'm being ridiculous, but um, how do you know that's not the Lord? Well, the Bible, the logos is the, is the rule. Um, when the logos says something, you can't say that the rhema is gonna go against the logos. Does that make sense? So it's so important that the, the, the test of authenticity of the rhema word from God um, is to how it compares to the whole of scripture. Um, you know, orthodoxy says God will not speak a word that uh, contradicts his written word. Uh, the scriptures, it's a built-in safeguard, which I love that, to prevent you know, misinterpretation. Um, you do have to be leery of people say, the Lord told me, and whatever comes out of their mouth next needs to match and be at least in line with and congruent with the rest of scripture. The obvious danger is one who's not familiar with the logos, um, by the way, the, the, I, I, I've seen this over the years, the people that are loose with uh, Rhema saying, God told me this, um, often it's not that they're maliciously trying to be against the Bible, but they just don't know the Logos. They don't, haven't really read the Logos. They're not familiar with what the, the Bible actually says. And so they're vulnerable to hearing words from maybe not the Lord, but could be from Satan himself, the deceiver, who's like an angel of light and speaks things. You know, um, Joseph Smith, uh, heard from an angel uh, Moroni, you know, and, and he got the glasses and the golden plates and he received a word and he believed it was a word from God. The only problem with his word, it went against the Logos. 
Um, remember Galatians says, um, Paul said, if we or an angel from heaven comes and gives you another gospel, other than that which we have preached, let that angel be accursed. In other words, it doesn't line up. And exactly, the Mormons believe in us, another gospel, another testament. And that's why it's dangerous when you start, you know, not letting the, the, the scriptures be the measurement. Uh, you can end up going way off course. So that's the caveat to the idea of the rhema word. I love when the spirit speaks exactingly in our lives with the small dagger, the small sword, and cuts away the flesh. I love that. But make sure it's truly the rhema from the Lord. That's, that's kind of important. Now, um, when it comes to the sword of the spirit, one of the things I love about the Bible is the multi-layered teaching of the Bible. And, and one of those things are these types or examples, like the sword is the word of God. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we were talking about the stone, which is Jesus, the rock of our salvation. And we talked about how, you know, these are types. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul said, you know, the rock that followed them in the wilderness that the water came gushing out of, that rock was Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. Um, it, and it uses the word type. These things are types or examples for us to learn. It's like Old Testament pictures speak of New Testament truth. And that's what makes the Bible so fun. So whenever I read a story about a sword in the Bible, I kind of think, I wonder if there's a picture here about the word of God that might be appropriate. Um, I wanna show you how that kind of works. Uh, there's a few stories I love. In fact, keep your finger here in Luke uh, 22 and flip back all the way into the book of Judges toward, toward the beginning of your Bible. Um, Judges chapter three. And since we've already talked bloody things with ears flopping on the ground, maybe this won't offend you too bad either. Uh, this is quite the story here in Judges chapter three. Uh, it involves a sword and a very specific sword, uh, which makes me kind of have a red flag. Is there, is there a reason why this sword is so specific in this story? Um, could it be a type or a picture of the word of God? Uh, and I'll, I'll show you how that works. Um, so the children of Israel, the book of Judges, they always were doing that which was right in their own sight. Relativism, kind of like America today where we call good evil and evil good. Remember on Prophecy Update uh, a couple nights ago, I was talking about Isaiah 520, uh, where you know the Lord in the fourth woe of Isaiah says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light, light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Um, that's, the, that's the culture we live in. Um, but the children of Israel, the book of Judges, that's the way they rolled. They were doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then the Lord would withdraw his help and blessing. And then they'd get thumped on by enemies and they'd end up being in big trouble and they'd cry out, Lord, save us. And the Lord graciously every time would come and save them and pull them out of their horrible situation. And then they'd start doing that which was right in their own sight again. Big cycle in the book of Judges. Well, we're in one of those cycles here in Judges chapter three. We pick it up there in verse 12. Judges 3, verse 12. It says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab. Sounds like something from Lord of the Rings. Eglon of Moab against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 13. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. Anybody know where the city of palm trees is in Bible land? Yes, Jericho, interesting. Just like this little oasis city, Eglon crushes the city of palm trees. So verse 14, so the children of Israel served Eglon, <coughs> excuse me, the king of Moab 18 years. Boy, there's a lesson right there. Sin always leads to bondage. They were, they were enslaved and in bondage serving Eglon king of Moab for 18 years. Sin always does that. That's a good lesson of the Bible. But the children of Israel, the Lord is always quick to help them when they repent. Check it out, verse 15. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gira, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. And by him, the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. So we got a guy that the Lord raised up. And, and this is something we would miss in our culture. Um, uh, but if you were a lefty in Bible times, there's a reason the Bible points this out. He was a left-handed guy. You're like, whatever. Um, but in Bible times, if you were left-handed, you were considered handicapped. They wouldn't even let you fight in battle because you couldn't even hold the sword in the right hand. Um, like that's the way they viewed it in those days. You were kind of a reject. 
Um, so sorry if you're a lefty here. Right? We've come a little further than this in modern times. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, as it turns out, uh, this was a big deal. He, in Ehud would normally be sort of rejected by people, but the Lord raises a lefty up for God's purpose. And there's a reason for that. We'll see it. Verse 16, but Ehud made him a dagger, which had two edges of a cubit length. A cubit in the Bible is about 18 inches. So it's a little sword, 18 inches long. And he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. Now, some of you are like, what's with the detail of the Bible? These, these stories have all this detail. Who cares what thigh he puts it on? It's all part of the story. If you're gonna try to get through TSA with a sword, um, you know, uh, we have a modern technology that hopefully will uh, find that um, or the box cutter or whatever you're bringing. But in Bible times, they, their, their TSA would pat you down. But if you were a lazy agent and you're checking people for weapons, nobody carried a sword on their right hand because they wouldn't let lefties carry a sword. So it was very unusual for a guy, if you were a right-handed sword bearer, you'd carry your sword on the left side, so you'd pull it out this way. So they'd always pat you down on the, on the left side if you were a right-handed sword, swordsman. But the idea of a lefty was so unusual, they wouldn't even check that side. That's kind of the idea. That's why the Bible's going into the detail, this 18 inch sword hidden on his right thigh, which they would probably not even check that side. Well, verse 17, and he brought the present to the Eglon, the king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. Okay, fat shaming in the Bible right here. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, now, you gotta understand, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when the Bible says this guy was very fat, he was very, very fat. There's actually history about this guy. He makes me look thin, so that's, you gotta understand, this guy was huge, um, had his own zip code. Verse 18, and when he had made an end to offer the present, uh, you know, the Jews gave him a present. Who knows what that is, but it was some nice little present. He sent away the people that bear the present, but he himself turned from the quarries um, that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, the king, keep silence. Picture this big, giant, fat king, Jabba the Hutt, sitting there. And he says, silence, everyone. He's got something to say. And he already got the present. Oh, a present for me? <laughs> you know, this Eglon guy. Um, and so Ehud says, man, I got something that's very serious I got, a, I got for you. And so he says, silence. And he, he, he made everybody leave. All that stood by him went out from him, says at the end of verse 19. Then verse 20, and Ehud came unto him and he, Eglon, was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Dad joke, I think he got the point. <laughs> you gotta say that, I'm sorry, in this story. He got the point. More than he got the point. In fact, check it out, verse 22. And the haft or the handle also went in after the blade. And the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly and the dirt came out. Dad, uh, Pastor Brett, I, I brought my grandma to church today and uh, are, you, are you kidding me? Are you want to talk about this story? Yep, this is a great one for grandma too. Uh, what does this have to do with us? This, well, notice, what a horrible thing. I mean, Egg, Eglon's sitting there and he shoves the knife into his belly and the knife just keeps going, the handle disappears. Uh, he can't even pull the handle out. Um, and, and then what's this thing? Dirt came out of his belly. Well, you can look up the dirt word in the Hebrew and I'm not gonna say it in church on a Sunday morning, but, but it's just filth and grossness. You say, Brad, what a horrible story. Now, by the way, when the Bible has grotesque stories, I believe there's actually real points to be learned. And there's a reason. It's like God's raising a red flag saying, this is kind of serious. Um, I don't think the Bible just arbitrarily tells stories like this for no real reason. What's the reason? Well, let's finish the story. Dirt comes out of his belly. Then verse 23, then Ehud went forth through the porch, shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. When he was gone out, his, uh, you know, Eglon's servants came. And when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked. They said, surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber. Uh, that's the King James way of saying, surely he's using the restroom facility. Let's not bother him right now. He doesn't like to be bothered when he's using the restroom. That's what they said. 
And they waited and they waited and they waited. How long did they wait? Well, the Bible says, verse 25, they tarried until they were ashamed. Uh, you know, they're like, man, he's been using the restroom a long time. Should we go check? I'm not gonna check on him. You check on him. I'm not gonna check on him. And they just sat around wondering what's going on. And finally, so long of time goes by that we, we better check on him. So behold, verse 25, he opened not the doors of the parlor. Therefore, they took a key and opened them. And behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. And Ehud escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries and escaped unto Seirah. Um, what a story here, the story of Eglon and Ehud. You say, Brett, what does this have to do with Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane? Come on. Well, it's the sword idea. And by the way, this is the small sword. Is that a Logos or a Rhema? It's Rhema. So that's kind of interesting. And, and a sword, if, if swords are a type of scripture, what possibly could we see in this story as a type or an illustration? Oh, there's a bunch of things. Now we have to be careful. I can't just make stuff up that are correlations with nothing in the Bible because that'd be, you know, that dangerous thing I warned about the, the, what we're talking about. But let me give you an example. Um, you know, the sword of the spirit uh, is a great weapon to defend against our enemy. Now, again, our weapons are not literal weapons, but spiritual to the tearing down of strongholds, defeating our foe. And so the word of God is our weapon. And, and what, what is it that defeats our enemy that is oppressing and putting in bondage the people of Israel? The sword is that which delivered the children of Israel from Eglon, the oppressor. So I see that as a beautiful example of what the word of God can do. The word of God can deliver us, um, uh, especially that rhema word, which is interesting, the 18 inch sword uh, is that which delivers people from the evil of the enemy. Well, Brad, you just made that up. You pulled that out of thin air on the story of Eglon. Question, can you prove elsewhere very clearly in the Bible that the word of God is the, the weapon that defeats the enemy? What about Matthew chapter four? One of the great spiritual battles of all time when Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And every time the devil um, hurled a, a temptation Jesus's way, what did Jesus do? Anybody remember? It is written. Every time Jesus quoted the sword of the spirit, the scripture, he used the word of God to defeat the enemy in that story. Oh man, we could go on and on. So I'm not just making stuff out of thin air. I'm, I'm saying, look, here's what the rest of the Bible says clear as a bell. But this Old Testament picture, see, I love the Old Testament for that. It's like a beautiful picture book of New Testament truth. We could even take it a little bit deeper um, uh, as the sword went deeper uh, into Eglon's belly. Um, what do you mean, Brett? Well, the sword went in and what came out? Dirt. Um, so you say, Brett, what, what possibly could we learn from that? Well, have you ever noticed that the word of God is also not only compared to a sword, but it's also compared to the cleansing water, the cleansing water. Um, the sword goes in, the dirt goes out. That's, that's one of the things the word of God does for you and me. What do you mean, Brett? Well, there's all kinds of scriptures that are clear on this one. Let me just give you some of my favorites. For example, John 15, three, Jesus said, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Also Psalm 119, verse nine, wherewithal or how shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed there according to um, thy word? There's a cleansing effect with the word. Also Psalm 119, verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Um, this is a big one, Ephesians chapter five, there in verse 25 and 26, um, you know, we're told husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of the water by the word. So the Bible tells us there's a, by the word of the Lord, there's a cleansing effect uh, on a person's life when you bring the word in. The word, the sword goes in, the dirt comes out. Now, you might be saying, okay, Brad, I, I, I got that. Uh, but, but let me ask you a question here before we move on from this. Um, are you saved salvation by the washing of the water of the word? Anybody wanna answer that? The answer is no, good. Um, there's only one cleansing agent that will save you from your sins by the washing of the, the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the old hymn, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So when we're talking about salvation, um, it's not that the, the, the word of God, the logos or the rhema saves you. That's important to know. It's the blood of Jesus that saves you. That's, that's the truth of the matter. 
You might say, well then Brett, why does the Bible talk so much about how it cleanses us? Well, it's, it's because of a couple things. I would say there's a positional and a practical perspective. Positionally in Christ, if you repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ, the blood that was shed on the cross, the Bible says he'll blot out your sins. He'll remember your sins no more. He'll put your sins as far as the east is from the west. And positionally in Christ, you are saved and forgiven and your sins have been washed away. That's how you're saved. But here's the thing. Practically, are you still kind of dirty? In fact, day to day, do we touch this dirty earth and do dirty things and watch dirty stuff and see, you know, like we know positionally we're forgiven, but we, it, you know what I'm reminded of? Remember when Jesus, um, shockingly there in John 13, Jesus shockingly stripped himself of his uh, uh, robes there at the dinner table and he wraps himself of a, in a towel and he's like a slave. He goes and starts washing the disciples' feet. And, you know, all the disciples are like, yeah, cool, Jesus is washing our feet. And it's like, you know, I can just see it in my mind's eye. You know, you know, James is like, yeah, can you get a little more between the big toe there? Yeah, thank you. Like, they're, they're, until Peter. Remember what happens when Peter, Jesus comes around and Peter realizes, what? Jesus, he says, he says, Lord, I should be, you shouldn't be washing my feet. I should be washing your feet. And you remember what Jesus said? Peter, unless you let me wash your feet, you can have no part with me. And then Peter, poor guy, puts his foot in his mouth again. Peter says, well then, Lord, not just my feet, but my head and my hands, like give me a whole bath then. If, and, and Jesus is like, Peter, do you remember what he said? You're, you're clean, only your feet are dirty. Uh, and he's making a spiritual point there. It wasn't just that physically he'd been walking in the dust and Jesus was washing the dust off his feet. The point is this, we're saved by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus, but practically you and I touch dirty, sinful things and, and daily, we need to sort of take a, a little bit of a washing, practical cleansing that comes from the word of God. That's why we should be daily in the word of God. I always uh, think of that when people come and say, Brett, you know, when I go to Wednesday night Bible study, it helps me understand the word. But when I re try to read the Bible on my own, the, it just goes through me like a sieve. I don't understand what I'm reading. And I always like to say, no problem. Keep reading the word and at least you'll have a clean sieve the washing of the water of the word. When Jesus said this to us in his word um, through Paul the apostle, Ephesians 5, 25, this verse I have up here, the last one, it says that he, Jesus, might sanctify and cleanse it. What's the it there? The church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his word that, that, um, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of the water of the word. The point that I'm making is the church is already saved. They're already the redeemed, saved church of Jesus Christ. And, and, and what Jesus does is he still wants to wash his church. He's already been saved by the blood, but practically we touch dirty things. So there's the cleansing that Jesus does by the washing of the water of the word. I know I'm probably spending too much time on this point, but oh, that's the beauty of the word of God. You and I, we need to be in the word daily, not just on Wednesday night or Sunday morning. We should daily be washing in the water of the word. There's a cleansing effect that the word of God brings, which I love that. So um, this, is the, this is the story that we get. You know, Eglon, we learned that the, the sword is that which defeats the enemy, even as Jesus used the word of God to defeat Satan in his temptations. Um, but the sword also goes in and the dirt comes out. There's a washing effect of the word of God. Those are all pictures. And we could go on and on. Let me just give you another quick one. Um, uh, Second Samuel, if you want, you can flip over there real quick. Just go the other direction a little bit. <clears throat> In Second Samuel chapter 23, there's a list of David's mighty men. If you like battles and swords and, and stuff like that, this is your chapter. Uh, there's a list of these amazing guys that did all kinds of uh, SEAL Team 6 type operations. One such guy is a guy whose name is Eliezer. He's the son of Dodo. Poor guy, I mean, he's already got that strike again. Your dad's name is Dodo, that's a tough beginning. But Eliezer, the son of Dodo, is quite a guy. Check this out. In verse 9 of 2 Samuel 20, 23, um, it says, After him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. In other words, they all said, let's get out of here. And they ran for their lives, big chickens. But he, Eliezer, verse 10, arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave to the sword. 
And the Lord wrought a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil. All the chickens that ran away, Elias is the one guy that stood and he fought. Um, by the way, this sword here is the big heavy sword, the big double-edged sword. And what's he doing? Like you can almost picture this guy, you know, cleaving to the sword and he's just woof, woof, woof. And the Philistine's like, let's get this guy. And he's just lopping heads off and chopping guys in half. Like this is just a, and, and the more they try to get him, the more he just slays all the Philistines. And all the other Jews come back later like, what happened here? Uh, and, like, and Eliezer's standing there. Uh, Eliezer put down the sword, but he couldn't you know what this is like. Remember when you were a little kid and you're riding above your skill level on your bicycle and you're hanging onto the handlebars and you're going down that hill and, and you're like, ah, and you, and you finally, when you get to, you're done, you're like, okay, I'm going to let go of the handlebar. And you're like, eh, eh, and you had to peel your fingers. Remember that off your, if you're into motocross, you know what I'm talking about. Forearm pump. After a race, you're like, you have to peel your fingers off the handlebars. <laughs> but, but that's what happens with Eliezer, the son of Dodo. He's just fighting battle and his, and his hand was cleaving to the sword. And, and what a beautiful picture. Again, the battle, um, we hold the word of God and hopefully, I, I would hope that you and I were daily using the word and then our hands are cleaving. Victory will be found as we cling to the word of God. What a truth and what a powerful thing. A literal story about um, you know, the use of a sword in victory. Um, by the way, Eliezer, the son of Dodo, is also seen another list of the same guys in 1 Chronicles 11, 12 through 14. The same guy, Eliezer, is guarding a field of not beans, that's, that's Shammah in, in the same chapter we're here. But in 1 Chronicles, Eliezer's guarding a feed, field of barley. And the Philistines come and say, we're gonna march across this field of barley. And Eliezer says, no, you're not. I'd be saying, how would you like your barley? Uh, we'll make cereal, uh, we can put it in yogurt, uh, we'll put it in a uh, blend jet and make it all, like, what do you want? Uh, but no, <laughs> Eliezer, the son of Dodo says, you're not going through this field. And they said, yes, we are. And once again, he gets his sword out woof, 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 and wipes out a whole nother Philistine army by himself, guarding a field of barley. This guy is a guy who walked in great victory because he was a man of the sword. And man, how we need men and women today that are men and women cleaving tirelessly to the word of God. The word of God is where victory is found. Not in our opinions, not in the latest news, not in the blogs and the podcasts. It's the, the word of God. And in this case, the logos, that's the idea. Well, back to Luke 22. You're like, Brett, come on, let's get back to the Peter story. Well, we, we uh, similarly look at the Peter story uh, where he pulls out a sword and there's lessons to be learned. And I'm just gonna say, these are lessons of what not to do. Um, and I feel bad, but I'm gonna knock Peter just a few times. Then we'll wrap it up here. Uh, Peter pitfall number one, notice with me, Peter's impatience. The disciples, they asked the Lord there, um, Lord, should we, should we uh, you know, what should we do? Should we pull out the swords now? They asked Jesus there um, in verse 49, shall we smite with the sword? But before they even get the question out and before Jesus can say yes or no, Peter's already zoring it up, pulled out his sword and he's already lopped off a guy's ear before Jesus can even say yes or no. Now, I, I can tell you what the answer, if Peter would have waited, we know what Jesus would have said. He would have said, leave your sword in the sheath. Don't pull out your sword. But Peter got ahead of the Lord and pulled out his sword. Are you a person that tends to get ahead of the Lord? Even while the question is being asked, you're already moving. I, I see this, this is a human nature thing that Peter does and I see it within myself, but I also have seen it in all these years of ministry of people that they're, they're asking the question, Lord, should I marry this man? Meanwhile, you're living with them, sleeping with them, you're having same checking accounts and you're pretty much everything but legally married with them. Lord, should I do this? And you're already swinging away. <laughs> Impatience is a bad, part of life. Uh, you don't want to be that person. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, Lord, I, I've seen this one. Lord, should I go into business with this guy? I know he's not a Christian and we have a different worldview on some things, but he's a good businessman. Lord, should I do this? And you're already investing. You're already pouring in, you know, a, applying for permits. And like, I've seen this where people just get ahead of the Lord. They might be sort of not even asking the question at all, but are you the person that jumps ahead? I've never regretted the decisions I've made very slowly and carefully and prayerfully. I have lived to regret, 
the decisions I made hastily because I really wanted to do it. Or I really, I almost knew that the Lord was gonna give me the negative answer. So I just kind of moved forward saying, I'm not even gonna ask. Um, that's a big mistake. Peter's an example of that. Um, you know, don't get ahead of the Lord. Um, what are you, Athe Creeker, tempted to do, but haven't heard from the Lord yet? Uh, can I just give you that word? Wait, be still, and know that he is God. Um, be slow to make those decisions. Very important. So the first thing we see here is Peter's impatience. He just starts hacking, slicing, and dicing, and, and it doesn't even give Jesus a, ta- a chance to answer. So Peter's impatience. Number two, notice with me, Peter's ineptitude. His ineptitude, what does that mean? Lack of skill. What is Peter lacking in skill of? What's, what, what could we say? Swordsmanship. Brett, how do you know that? Well, like, do the math on this thing. You got these Roman soldiers, these big, buff, trained soldiers with swords and spears and armor, and they come up, <coughs> dun, 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 you know, the Rome music in the movies, dun, 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 and they're coming up. And then Peter, the Roman soldiers, the, the high priest, the, you know, Caiaphas, Annas, um, all these fancy people. And, and, and who does go, Peter go after? Does he go after the biggest, baddest Roman soldier with his little sword? Um, or does he go after the high priest? He goes after the, the, probably the biggest pencil neck in the whole group, the servant of the high priest, little Malchus. I mean, I'm not sure that he's a little dude, but I picture Malchus, if he's the servant of the high priest, why is Peter targeting him? He's probably the less threatening guy of the whole group, probably the, the, the you know, 90 pound weakling guy. And Peter's like, I'm gonna get you. <laughs> and, and he misses he doesn't even, what is he aiming for? I don't know. Was he trying to stick him in the face with a sword? In the Old Testament, there's very graphic description of assassins like Abner and like Joab. And the Bible even says they were skilled uh, like assassins. And the Bible describes how they knew how to take their dagger and stick it between the fourth and the fifth rib and how they, like it was an instant death. Like the Bible talks about these skills. That's not Peter. Peter's like, I'm gonna get you. And he runs after with his little little dagger and he uh, misses the guy and chops off his ear. Um, The point that I make is, are you inept with the word of God, the sword of the spirit? Um, You can often tell a person who's not really good with the Bible or the sword of the spirit if they're using it flailing away, quoting scriptures that they barely know at people, often speaking them out of context or using them brutally and and misusing scripture. Here's an example. Let's say you're a husband and your wife is not doing what you want her to do. So you say, the Bible says, poopsie. (laughs) Wives, submit to your husband. (laughs) Okay, Zorro, put down the sword. Um, That's a horrible use of scripture. If you're a husband telling your wife, wives, submit to your husband, you are misusing the sword. Um, okay, the husband's like, great, Brett, thanks a lot. Well, let's say you're the wife and there you are. Honey, well, you tell me to submit, but right after that, it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself, die. That's what the Bible says. You're supposed to die, honey buns. Um, are you zoroing it up with your Bible, quoting scripture at each other as a married couple? Could I just say, repent? That's not the way scripture is to be used. Um, I see an abuse of scripture. Uh, It's used all the time. And uh, uh, oftentimes people, they they misuse the Bible because they don't really know the Bible. They're not good swordsmen. If you're in the old Bible times, survival meant you had spent some time wielding a sword. Hopefully you weren't a novice. If you were ending up in battle, you better know how to use a sword or you'd be dead. They say it takes a certain amount of time before someone's an expert in anything. Um, There's been books written. They say 10,000 hours. If you do 10,000 hours of something, you're an expert. Um, And so, you know, some of these great swordsmen of the ancient times were probably guys that had spent a lot of time wielding a sword and they're the ones who survived. In the same way, spiritually, I think it's so wise when you spend time wielding the sword. What do you spend your time doing? Are you an expert in stuff? It's like, you know, when grandma and grandpa walk up to grandson and granddaughter who's there playing a video game on TV, on their TV, you know, or whatever. And 
Grandma's going, wow, how do you do that? And the kid hands the grandma the controller. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Grandma's, the gun's up in the air and she's going around a circle like this. And then she gets shot. Like, come on, grandma, you're supposed to run. And she's like, what are you supposed to? And then the kid grabs it. And, and, and the grandma's like, wow, you're just so, am- young people these days, they're so talented. No, grandma. Junior's been playing Call of Duty for 10,000 hours. And Junior, if you've been playing Call of Duty, Grandpa did it for real for 10,000 hours. Um, you know, it's a kind of a funny thing how uh, our culture is, you know, what are we really good at? What do we spend our time doing? Can I just say, spending 10,000 hours in the Word of God, that's a good idea. Um, daily reading the Word of God, being a good swordsman, not in a literal killing people, but our, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but our battles against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, like Jesus in Matthew 4, the temptations of the devil. But the way you have victory is you, you become a good swordsman, a swords person to know the scriptures. And that's why I love Athey Creek. I love that you guys are willing to go through longer Sunday services because we have an objective. We're trying to get through the Bible. On Wednesday night, I love it. You know, our parking lot's packed. There's no more room for people on a Wednesday night Bible study. That's so cool because I, I know how that is. I grew up in a church that said, we're gonna, we're gonna make Wednesday night just part of our weekly stuff. Um, and we went through the Bible together. And, and man, the value that that has provided those who stuck with it for the years and start to have kind of a handle on what the word of God actually says. Um, this is so cool. I'm glad I grew up with men, particularly as a young boy, who loved the word of God and, and were good knowing the scriptures. I grew up at a very young age saying, man, I want to know the scriptures like those guys because I saw the fruit in their lives and how they used the sword of the spirit. Very important. Well, um, one other quick thing with the sword of the spirit. Um, did Jesus, um, was Jesus good at using the sword of the spirit? This is an easy one, you guys. Um, uh, you know, what's funny, if you really think about it, Jesus is the sword of the spirit, right? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, if Jesus was the embodiment of the true word of God, the logos, um, which he is, um, what did people conclude about the things that he spoke? The living word of God, God incarnate, Jesus, What did they say about how he talked to people? Well, we know that he blasted some of the religious guys and used the word against them. There's truth there. But when people sort of said, when he speaks, does anybody remember? What was their conclusion about what he said? Anybody? They marveled at his gracious words. See, it's not the husband saying, submit to me, woman. That's That's not Jesus. But they marveled at his gracious words. He, he wasn't misusing the, the scripture as so many people do, but he was one who was edifying and encouraging. And the narrative was, wow, he's brutal. The narrative was, wow, his words are gracious. Just keep that in mind. The more skilled you are in the word of God, I think the more gracious you will be with the word of God. One final note, and that is Peter's ignorance. Uh, I know I'm blasting poor Peter, but like I said, we'll get back to complimenting him in the book of Acts. But Peter's ignorance, what was his biggest ignorance? I think it's this, he's he's clueless as to what Jesus' true objective was. I'll stop this. And remember, they already had this discussion a few hours earlier at the dinner, at the last supper. I'm gonna go and be crucified. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna kill me. And on the third day, I'm gonna raise from the dead. And Peter says, not so, Lord, I will protect you. And Jesus said, Peter, before this night's over, you're gonna deny me three times and then the rooster's gonna crow. We'll see that on Wednesday night. So Jesus has already had this discussion. I'm going to the cross. That's my objective. And Peter's not so. And even after having the discussion, Peter's like, da, 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 I will save you from going to the cross. And you and I better be real glad Peter wasn't successful in this little attack. If Peter would have stopped the, the cross, you and I would be doomed to hell for all eternity. But because Jesus willingly, intentionally went to the cross, you and I have salvation through the cross of Jesus Christ. You say, what's your point, Brett? Well, here's the problem. We as Christians, we get caught up on so many other things and we get our own little agenda and we we may forget that the Lord has his own purpose and plan. And I would just say, Jesus and the cross is the most important thing you and I can ever talk about, think about, work on, speak, proclaim, declare, preach. It's the cross. That's why Paul the apostle, who was brilliant, he could talk about any subject with great 
intellectualism. But instead, he said, I have determined to know nothing except for what? Anybody? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said, that's the whole thing right there. And, and can I just remind you that, that are maybe uh, tempted to go full headline. Now, I, I, I gotta say, I, I, I do, I'm concerned about the issues uh, it's an election year. We have topics that I've already mentioned, you know, the abortion issue and uh, immigration. We could talk about all these things. And I sometimes think the religious right, uh, we have to be really careful, the conservatives or whatever you want to call the Christian nationalists, as people derogatorily tend to call that. Um, one thing I'd like to remind us um, that we need to be careful to make sure that we keep the main thing the main thing. And as important as immigration is, I'll admit, we should vote and all that. The cross is more important. The cross is more important than the immigration issue. It's more important than the economy. The cross of Jesus Christ is more important than a potential war with Iran. Uh, there's a much bigger issue, the cross of Jesus Christ. What do you do with your knowledge of the cross of Jesus Christ? Or are you like Peter, off fighting the wrong battle <coughs> or even winning the wrong battle um, only to have people still going to hell? In other words, you know, um, uh, you know, you can figure out the, the perfect economy. You might be able to figure out and solve the immigration issue. Good luck with that. Um, you might be able to end all wars and still be headed to hell. Do you understand that? We could do really good things, but the cross of Jesus Christ and salvation for the sinner, it supersedes all other issues. And Peter misses that. He's trying to get in there and fight the Romans. Uh, he wants to get in there and stop what's happening with the religious leaders and the Jews. He's trying to get in there and fight, but he's just got the wrong, he's not keeping the main thing, the main thing. And that's Jesus willingly, purposefully going to the cross. That was Christ's objective the whole time. I think we have to be careful to remember the old hymn. You know, I have decided to follow Jesus. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. That's what we need to be all about. And you know, what matters is, are you saved? Is your neighbor saved? Um, would you rather argue with your neighbor about the solution to the immigration problem or talk to them about the saving work of the cross of Jesus Christ? Um, would you rather picket and march against abortion, you know, advocates? Or would you rather them come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? By the way, um, it's that whole thing where Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men, but we as Christians, we wanna clean the fish before we catch them. You can't do that. You gotta catch them first. The best way to, in my opinion, to stop you know, people who are willing to do or have abortions is they need to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Once they hear the gospel and know Jesus, the love of Christ, I think the Lord will convict them of sin and that the Lord will do the cleaning of the fish, not us. Um, the best thing you and I can focus on is Jesus and the cross of Jesus Christ. Don't make the same mistake. Peter's ignorance was Jesus was going to the cross. That was the biggest thing that would ever happen in the history of the world. So a little eerie story in the Bible, and I would say and finish, let he who has an ear, let him hear <laughs> what the Spirit says to the church today. Let's pray. Lord, I pray your blessing on this crew as we go from this service. Um, give us understanding and application, Lord, for those that may not know you or not saved, have never repented of their sins. May they repent and turn to you and be saved. Um, but Lord, keep us on the main thing. Help us to focus on what matters most. Help us to fight the right battles with the right weapons. May Athe Creekers be wielders of the sword of the spirit and be skilled in using the word in a way that would be pleasing to you. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name, amen.